All right, ladies and gentlemen. Difficult topic. <laughs> Not an easy one. Because whenever Saturn changes a sign, Sarasati begins for somebody. It ends for someone, but it also begins for someone, right? There was one person who asked me recently, who should fear Sarasati? Should I fear it? Please tell me, sir. Should I fear I have this, this, this planet here? Mm, this displacement here? This, this transit there? Should I fear it or should I not fear it? Right? So what should I do? Sare Sati is on cards. But I don't know if I should fear it. <laughs> Most of the times when uh, people hear... Oh, my Sarasati is going to start. You know, what's going to happen? Then they they get fear, right? There's this in the TV screens also you will see, right? Is Rashi ki Sarasati shuru hone wali hai? Aayye dekhte hai meen Rashi ke jatko ke liye. Have you seen those videos? I mean, on a daily basis, right? So what to speak of the transit of Saturn, which is for seven and a half years, right? So if you don't know what is Sarasati, then please go and watch the other videos in my playlist. I have a lot of videos on Sarasati. And if you're new to the channel, then please subscribe to it down below. And if you want a consultation from me, my website is also down below in the description section. And yes, God is there with you. He was there, he is, and he will always be there with you, irrespective of when your Sarasati is starting or when it's ending, right? So Sarasati is a very interesting transit of Saturn because it doesn't generally we take transits from the ascendant only. But Sarasati is a transit of Saturn which you know is from the moon. Now what is why does why does it have to be so interesting if it's from the moon? Well because have you seen sometimes things happen in front of you and you don't think much about it, right? That's like certain things happening from your ascendant. But when something happens from the moon, you are actually perceiving it. So when Saturn comes in the 12th house from your moon, then your Sarasati begins. That's the first phase. The second phase is when Saturn is directly on top of your moon and the third phase is when Saturn is in the second house from your moon. Now what happens when Saturn is transiting the 12th house from the moon? Or in general, what happens when Sarasati comes? Well, you realize Saturn when Sarasati comes. It's that simple. Now what is Saturn? Saturn represents the teachings of the various scriptures. I mean, he literally does not represent scriptural teachings. That's represented by Jupiter, Sun, Mars, Ketu. But Saturn can show conclusion of certain facets of the scriptures, especially the connection to Upanishads, right? Why? If you read the Vedas, generally when people see, oh, they say, oh, Vedic culture, you know, Indian culture, blah, blah, blah. But... Whatever you see in modern day India or Vedic culture, as you say, it's primarily, not 100%, but 99%, um, it is a mixture of the Vedas and Upanishads. Now, what are the Vedas? The Vedas are those books, those body, bodies of knowledge, uh, which encourage you for mundane materialistic progress, right? So, for example, in the Vedas, there's a lot of glorification. There's a lot of hype around going to Swarga and glorification of Indra Devata, right? And then there are other things, you know, like Matri Devabhava, Pitri Devabhava, this, that. My God, there are so many things in the Vedas, right? It's like never ending. So, family life is glorified in the Vedas. One who gets married is glorified. One who has children is even further glorified. Of course, uh, in Vedic times, there is no concept of 
marriage without children that's like a uh, new concept in Kali Yuga as Kali Yuga is getting worse, right? But nonetheless, Vedas encourage materialistic prosperity. And then there are different things like, you know, the Yagyas, Homas, and there's Prayaschit and so many other things. These are part, uh, the, the Vedas, they encourage you to indulge materially, but, 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 within certain limits, right? Like, for example, if somebody is addicted to meat, then the Vedas do not encourage that you keep eating meat all the time, right? So the Vedas and, and the overall Vedic ethos, they say you should offer it to Goddess Kali um, in certain times of the Panchang only you should do it, right? On certain dates, you should not do. Certain days, you should do it. And then you should also give donation. You should give in charity, blah, blah, blah. Or it's restriction, basically. Why? Because some restriction makes you more free. Too much restriction uh, curbs your freedom. But no restriction makes you handca handicapped. It puts you into jail. Imagine a person who has no restriction. He's doing whatever he wants whenever, right? The mind will be disturbed always. So the Vedas encourage, similarly, sex life. The Vedas say that if you are unable to control your sex desire, then you are allowed to marry. But not more than one. <laughs> All right. So because if, if there is unrestricted sex, sexual enjoyment, then... Uh, there is mayhem in the society and the person, his or her own consciousness also goes into ruins, right? So in short, that's what the Vedas represent. You know, give donations, do this, do that, do this yagya, go to the Swargaloka, do Ashwamedh yagya, do Rajasuya yagya, all these things. All these are concepts of the Vedas primarily. They are there in the other sections also of the scriptures. Now comes the Upanishads. Drastically different. Totally the other, other way around. In Upanishads, family life is vehemently condemned. <laughs> no, it's like, oh, what is this, you know, children, what is this husband, wife, mother, father, it's all nonsense. These are all Maya. These are, as they say, you will hear this sometimes. They say, sub -mo Maya. <laughs> now, of course, sub -mo Maya, uh, in India, people say sometimes. This, this in English, uh, who do not know this literally means, oh, everything is an illusion ultimately, right? So, of course, when people say this in India, they mean it with a different context. You know, when they are unable to do something, you know, they will say, oh, sub -mo Maya. <laughs> or when they don't understand or they need to justify their ina own inadequacies, inability, then they say, what is the right? But the Upanishads literally condemn materialistic prosperity, material engagement, marriage, everything is condemned. They say these are like useless waste of time. Why? Because the Upanishads say you are the soul. Now, of course, the Vedas also say the same thing. But Upanishads speak things more from a spiritual perspective where detachment is encouraged. Detachment from matter, materialistic uh, things, you know, money, opposite sex, you know, sensual pleasure. And then you are encouraged to live like a monk, as a celibate, as a hermit. And have not much material engagements, right? Renounce basically, right? Now, in the Vedic culture, you will see in reality, both the extremes are there. You know, when somebody is of the marriageable age, they will force him or her to get married, you know, then have children. And then earlier it is not now, they, they were also encouraged to take sannyas, right? But Shani Maharaj represents the teachings of the Upanishads, right? Because the Upanishads tell you, 
Oh, my dear sir, my dear madam, what are you doing with this life? You are just enjoying like cats and dogs. Why? Because humans and animals, see, animal life is characterized by four things. Four things. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Eating, sleeping, mating and defending. Right? So, Eating, sleeping, mating, defending. What is this? Number one, maybe it's self-explanatory. <laughs> but human beings, they are expected to go beyond eating, sleeping, mating and defending. Human beings are supposed to do Atma Jigyasa, Tattva Jigyasa, right? Understand, Athato Brahma Jigyasa as the Vedanta Sutra says, Oh, my dear child, inquire about yourself, who you are. <laughs> what are you doing in this world? What, what the hell are you doing in this world? Who are you? You are this um, son of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so, husband of so-and-so, wife of so-and-so, children. You are IT engineer, mechanical engineer. You are a chartered accountant. You are tax advisor. You are a politician. You are a doctor. Who are you? Are you these identities or are you something else or maybe much more than them? Who are you? So that's the question of the Upanishads because the Upanishads have two very important teachings. It says materialistic pleasure has an end. And even if it does not have an end, it, I mean end means there are limitations. And even if there are no limitations, it's still temporary, right? So take the example of some nice desert that you like to eat. Gulab jamuns, for example, right? Is it limited, the number of gulab jamuns in this world? Maybe almost unlimited, maybe limited, right? That's one limitation, it's limited. The other limitation is, even if there are unlimited number of sweets, but we can't eat them all. Right. So even though there is abundance, first of all, there may not be abundance. Secondly, even if there is abundance, there is still scarcity because our capacity to enjoy that is limited. And even if we can enjoy unlimitedly, <clears throat> we won't be there here after maybe a hundred years. Right. So the Upanishads say that at the end, everything is going to end. All the material engagements will cease to exist. So therefore, focus on God. Focus on spirituality. Start gaining spiritual wisdom. Because everything else will give you misery. A very good career. At the end, you will be stripped off. Right? A very good marriage. Your spouse or you, one of them will leave one day. Right? Parents, children... Husband, wife, friends, brothers, sisters. Either you leave them or they leave you. Right? So, whatever good is there in this material world, eventually the end result is you are miserable. Either in short term or in long term, you are miserable. You may not realize it now. You will realize it after some time. But you will be miserable. But does it mean we just have to be miserable? Oh, I am so miserable. I am so unhappy. Do I just have to be happy with the fact that I am not happy? Well, exactly not. Because then we have the Puranas, right? Which teach us about the activities of God. So there are 18 Puranas. You know, six Puranas are in the mode of, uh, mode of ignorance, uh, which explain about the mode of ignorance. Then there is mode of passion, six Puranas, and six Puranas in the mode of goodness, Sattva Guna. And if you talk of the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita is like the summary of all the Upanishads, right? It's also known as Gita Upanishad, 108 Upanishads, right? So in the Bhagavad Gita, also Lord Krishna says that this, this world, material world, is a place of misery. Dukhalaya Mashashvatam, Lord Krishna says this. And essentially that's what happened. That's what actually goes through. One goes through when there is Sadesati, right? They experience misery, pain, suffering and all this. 
and then there is the next level of the Bhagavad Gita, which is you know the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Bhagavad Gita tells you who are you? You are not this body, you are spirit soul. This is what the Bhagavad Gita tells you. But then that's not it all. Okay, I uh, I know theoretically, I am not this body, I am Atma, I am spirit soul. Okay, fine, great, thank you. <laughs> but what do I do now? Do I just sit and do nothing? <laughs> No, then the Srimad Bhagavatam comes into the picture. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the Amalam Purana, right? It is known as the Paramhamsa Samhita, which is uh, studied and relished by the Paramhamsas, the great devotees of God, right? So, when we uh, study the Srimad Bhagavatam, then we know how does God behave one-to-one -one as a person, because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita and he leaves, right? And then of course Krishna also tells Arjuna, no, Sarvadharman Paritya, O oh, Arjuna, surrender unto me. Aham toam sarva pape bhiyo moksha ishami masucha. I will deliver you from all uh, sins. Do not fear. Masucha, Krishna says, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. But the thing is, Mm, how do you do spiritual practices without knowing Krishna as a person? Now, Bhagavad Gita has description of Lord Krishna. He, Krishna himself describes him. Uh, but but it's not much. Right? Krishna says a lot of things about him. Right? But then that's also not enough. So then there is Srimad Bhagavatam where we understand the creation, you know, how this universe was created, you know, through Vishnu and then through Brahma and then the Prajapatis, you know, Daksha and all this, right? And then we understand the cosmo cosmology, fifth canto, and then we go to tenth canto where we understand Lord Krishna properly. So when we read the Srimad Bhagavatam, then we will actually know the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita more. The Bhagavad Gita is like bachelor studies. Bhagavatam is like master studies. High, high level studies. Because Lord Krishna says in the uh, Bhagavad Gita that when one develops higher taste, one can get rid of uh, mundane materialist engagements, right? He says, Param Drishtva Nivartate. He says, when somebody gets Param Drishtva means experiences higher happiness by doing spiritual practices, Nivartate. Then this person can get rid of materialistic attachment and enjoyment, uh, enjoying mentality, right? Otherwise, Bhogeshwarya prasakta nam taya parita chetasa Vyavasaya atmika buddhi samadhona vidyate Right, so when one is too much, when one is too much hankering after materialistic enjoyment and is also indulging it, not only hankering, then one develops no determination for spiritual progress. Have you seen some people, you talk to them about spirituality and they're like, you know, yawning and they're like, you know, not interested, you know, they're like, oh, what the hell is this boring person speaking, right? They will brand you as a number one boring person in the room, right? Why? Because, Bhoga Ishwarya Prasakta Ram, Taya Apa Rita Chetasa, Rita Chetasa, Rita Chetasa means, their chetana has been, rita means it has been stolen by materialistic sense enjoyment. The inner soul, the soul is stolen. Of course, the soul cannot be stolen, but it's said in essence, right? So therefore, we need to study the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, if anybody feels that Oh, this man, this material world, you know, this is only a place to enjoy. You know, it's like maja karo life, man. Just enjoy. You know, it's like it's your place after all. You got to enjoy. You know, of course, you can enjoy. No, no, nothing wrong with enjoying, but it has to be done under limitations. And we should be focused on doing spiritual practices. Both have to happen simultaneously. If you just keep saying, "Oh yeah, I will just," you know. Uh, Enjoy under limitations, you know, like the Vedas say. Or I will not enjoy, as the Upanishads say. You will be frustrated. Either way, you are frustrated. Even if you enjoy, you will be frustrated. If you, if you don't enjoy, you will be also frustrated, right? 
So the best is we enjoy within the periphery of the scriptural regulations. And then in the morning we do spiritual practices. We chant God's names. Now we do some Mangal Arati. We do some Shringar. And then we read the Srimad Bhagavatam. In the weekends we visit spiritual communities. Associate with sadhu, saintly persons. And of course try to achieve, uh, try to inculcate a personal one-to-one -one relationship with God. And as the Srimad Bhagavatam says, Eteh cha amsa kalapum saam krishna stu bhagavana swam. Right? So therefore, uh, let's try to read the Bhagavad Gita sometimes. Let's try to read the Srimad Bhagavatam or the Vishnu Sastanam. That will actually help us. So whoever understands this need not fear Sarasati. And whoever mm, does not understand this, whoever thinks that this world is a place of merry... <laughs> going around indulging recklessly with material pleasure, that person needs to fear Sarasati. Thank you very much.